Tessa, thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure. It's funny that you're only now coming on. I feel like you should have been like my first like five to 10 episodes, but hey, everything is divine timing as always. Yes, totally. No, I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much. Of course. So one thing I always ask everyone just to kind of set the stage of, we always go through a lot of traumatic things in our life and what I call like big T traumas, but throughout our daily life, we're having hardships all the time. So has there been anything in your life in the last like week, month that's kind of got you down or any big wins lately? Like what's current? Yeah, I feel like that's a really like easy answer for me because (laughs) last week, well, and even just, you know, a couple of days ago, I just landed from, I landed in Toronto from Portugal because I was running a yoga retreat. So I would say, you know, I had, I had a really big win. We had about 20 people come to Portugal and, you know, eat amazing food and drink Portuguese wine and do yoga and explore the beaches and, and really, really dive into that sort of wellness retreat week. So I would say, obviously that was a huge huge win. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, being on retreat is like when you're hosting is it's a lot of energy to, you know, to hold for, for that many people, even if it's just like very small nuanced things. So it was such a great week and I'm also very tired. (laughs) Well, you were just saying that how jet lagged you were and that jet lag is probably going to last like a week, if not more. Yeah, I know, especially with the time change, like happening just before we kind of left and then, and just the days being darker and it's, yeah, it's all kind of part and parcel, but you know, whatever, whatever it means to travel, I'm good with it. I feel like you've traveled a bunch for yoga retreats before. This is definitely not the first time, but this is the first one that you organized. No, I've actually organized quite a few as well before. This is the first international retreat under like my new yoga brand, Moro. But we have also had a couple, like we did one in Prince Edward County. We did one in Muskoka under Moro. But yeah, it is like our first international retreat as Moro Yoga. So that was Mm kind of cool. Any challenges arise? hosting 20 people in Portugal? (laughs) Well, I mean, yeah, we, there was a point where the retreat center didn't have hot water. So that was an issue obviously, because even though it's warmer in Portugal than it is in Toronto, it was cold, you know, like it's still the fall. So we didn't have hot water, which was not great. So I'm kind of the middle person. I'm trying to answer to like my guests and also just be managing like what the deal is with the retreat center. And, And they were good, you know, Um, And so we're our guests. So it's just, like I said, like, it's all kind of a part of it, unfortunately, but all things considered, I would say it was, it was a really wonderful retreat. Yeah. How long were you there again? A week? More than a week? Uh, Well, like I was there like 10 days just because I wanted to land for a couple of days and get acclimatized to the, um, the space and also to the, to the time before we were like on and hosting, but the week was, the retreat was one week. So (laughs) So nice. And where are you going next? You're going somewhere again in... We don't have anything planned, but we've been talking about Greece. So I'm pretty sure... Why don't you just stay over there? (laughs) We'll have have something announced before the end of the year for Greece. So stay tuned. I'm excited. Amazing. Are you going away soon too? I'm actually going to Curacao in December for a much... So it's in the Caribbean, but like everyone asks me that when, when I um, say that I'm going to Curacao and I actually didn't plan the trip. My, oh. my boyfriend planned the trip. So I really have no idea what our itinerary is or where we're staying or anything like that. that. I know that I'm going to Curacao. So that's kind of exciting and that it's on a beach. So I'm, I'm in, you know, <laughs> if there was a love language called someone plan the trip and I show up the airport, that's my love language. Yeah. Yeah, me too. And this has never happened possible. before. I'm always the planner. So I'm I'm very excited to lean into that. It's gonna be great. That Virgo energy. Totally. Totally. <laughs> no one can surprise me for that reason either. Like I'm not a like you can't, you can't like you're already pre-planned, I, ready. I just know. I know what's happening. I always and you've thought to... of everything that could possibly go wrong too. <laughs> Probably. Oh my God. Good for you. I, it's funny. It's like, I'm type A in a lot of ways, but when it comes to that stuff, I'm just like, just tell me what I need to pack. I'll show up and I'll take it day by day. Like yeah. the, the pre-planning is what, and the, the knowing what's going to happen is gives me a bit of anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. No I would way. say that I'm like kind of a high quick start in that way too. Like I, I am, yeah, I'm like maybe on the cusp of Virgo and maybe that's why, but I just, I'm, I'm a very high quick start. I ordered two things and just keep the thing that is the right thing. You know what I mean? I just don't want to, I don't even want to do the research or deal with it. So 
I feel um, that. But I, I do always have a plan. So, <laughs> all right. I want to start asking you about all the things and why we are here. How I want to link this, though, is the same thing that you said in your bio, where I feel like everything that you went through, I feel like, or do you feel like all of your years of practicing yoga prepared you to be able to handle something so traumatic? Um, I think that maybe retrospectively, yes. And I would say that in the moment, no, like, no, it was a total, a total shit show when it went down. (laughs) <laughs> Literally. So I want to um, let the audience know about a little bit of like the timeline, the diagnosis, give them the like the Cole's notes of what went down because I know personally, but for everyone else listening. So essentially, Tessa uh, initially got diagnosed with breast cancer at age 26, correct? That's and fair. we will go through the entire story. But long story short, you ended up getting another cancer diagnosis shortly yeah. after. Yeah. Everyone listening now is just like, excuse me, like one's enough. Like, how do you get to a second one? So I chronologically, I want to walk everyone through that. If you want to tell just kind of the timeline, that kind of thing. And I will ask you the deeper questions. Yeah, for sure. So it was actually shortly before my 26th birthday that I started sort of presenting with some symptoms that were concerning. So I went to my doctor and they, they were basically testing me for something called prolactin or high prolactin, which is something that a lot of women who are in their childbearing years will typically have higher levels of, or when they're breastfeeding. So it wasn't completely alarming when I first went to sort of get some things checked out. And, uh, they did a few tests, you know, noticed that I didn't have high prolactin. This was all sort of like on the same, the same timeline that I was seeing a naturopath and trying to address just some cycle issues and like addressing some hormonal stuff. So Mm -hmm. it was kind of interesting because I was seeing her. And when I got like officially got my diagnosis, I was getting the results to some estrogen, well, like a whole hormone panel, but she was just like, oh yeah, I'm totally not surprised because your estrogen is just totally through the roof. So just to back it up, I mean, I, I continued to sort of follow the chain of command when I was being tested for certain things in my blood. And then they started to do a couple ultrasounds and things like that. I was referred to a um, breast oncologist in Toronto. His name is Jory Simpson. He's wonderful. And he basically you know, had his team do ultrasounds, I believe at the time I never had a biopsy and they did in fact see what they called like a little note. And they were like, you know, it's nothing to worry about. Like I had pretty cystic breasts, um, which is quite normal as well for, for women my age. And so they were like, you know, we'll just keep our eyes on it. It doesn't seem like it's too concerning. It just seems to be like pressing on some, some not so ideal areas. So Mm -hmm. they just wanted to continue with some follow-up. And ultimately I went back maybe a couple of weeks later because my quality of life was just being affected with the symptoms that I was presenting. And in what way? Well, basically like a lot of people would ask, like, did I feel a lump? Was it like painful? No, nothing like that. So the symptoms that I was experiencing were um, like discharge basically. And that, from what I've heard, is not typically in, um, indicative. indicative of the type of cancer that I that I ultimately was diagnosed with. So, um, which makes I it so back. hard for doctors because as doctors, you're either going going with like what you've experienced in the cases that you've seen, or you're saying these symptoms equal this. So if it's not usually linked to what they think it is, it it leads you down a path of I don't know what the hell is going on as a doctor and yeah. as a patient. Yeah. And I think that with like breast cancer in particular, like one thing that I've learned is, and again, I I will get back to like the more chronological part of my story, but it's that like, first of all, when you have a diagnosis, a lot of people are like, oh, my mom had breast cancer. My friend had breast cancer. And like so many women have had it. So like, yes, it's helpful to be connected to those women, but almost actually, frankly, no one has had the same journey as me. And I know that that's the same for everyone else. Like the treatment, the, like the type of cancer, the stage of cancer, your age, like whether you're HER2 positive, whether you're estrogen receptor positive is also indicative of like, you know, what your journey is going to be. So even though it's helpful 
to talk to people who have also had uh, like a similar situation. It's not like you can just like align yourself with someone and and walk Mm -hmm. down the same path as them, unfortunately. And follow the same treatment process and whatnot. Like it seems like like every single majority of cases are pretty unique. It sounds. Totally. And that, and that has been my experience for sure. And especially given my age. So basically what happened was I went back and said, I'm really not like comfortable keeping this node in my body. I would really love for you to remove it. And they were like, okay, no problem. We'll do that. They booked a surgery for me, November of 2017. And we're looking at five years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And so I had a lumpectomy and I remember my uh, follow-up with my doctor like the day of, cause it's just a kind of in and out procedure. And he was like, yeah, everything like, you know, looked good. We'll see you in a couple of weeks, whatever. And I don't know if that was just a function of him trying to not scare you, alarm you. Yeah. Or like, yeah. Or show concern until there was something to be concerned about, or if he was actually not concerned, but ultimately I, that was actually like a pretty wild morning because I went to my follow-up by myself, which was like, not in retrospect, like a good idea. I totally should have had somebody with me. Why do you say that? Like, just to know, like, because really at the at the time you're going back for results and the follow-up is usually when you're getting the results, you kind of want to be with some either good or bad news. It's a lot yeah. to take on as your, as your own, I imagine. Yeah, I think so. And and I think that it was just that I was totally not expecting for it to be bad news. I think I was expecting um, them to be like, in fact, cancer wasn't even like in my mind. It was just like, no problem. We'll remove this, this lump, you know, and we'll move because on. Because it's basically. a story we've heard before. Like as women, we know women our age that have cysts on their ovaries that you just get removed. Little lumps where yeah. like one of my Laser, friends have a, like yeah. That. I have a lump and her doctor's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, we'll just monitor it. And I'm sure that's kind of what you expected to hear, which is why you didn't bring anyone. Cause you're like, this is a quick errand and I'm going on to the rest of my day. Totally. And I mean, like, I know my mom would have wanted to have been there. Like, you know, retrospectively, we all, we all know what, what ended up happening. So I do remember my doctor being very surprised. He was like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. And I'm really like shocked actually at these results, but you have something called DCIS, which is uh, short for ductal carcinoma in situ. And the thing about DCIS is it's actually qualified as a precancer, but because it hasn't yet metastasized when it's found, it's treated just like a metastatic cancer. Mm. So technically I had a cancer diagnosis, even though it was like very, very early stages. So the way that it works is like with DCIS, you have, I think, I think it's one to three grades and then you go to stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. So it's there. almost like pre one to three stage. Then we go one to three again. Totally. So my doctor wanted me to do some follow-up treatment. He was like, you know, you have a few options. I do remember him saying to me, I don't know why this was like, well, actually I do like, I understand why it was like, so like profound when like the words left his mouth, but I remember him being like, you're not going to die. Like, this is like a very like, you know, treatable type of cancer. Like, but I could just tell that he was like almost sad for me that like, I was going to have to go through the treatment that I was going to have to go through, which basically involved a deeper investigation on like, you know, where the cancer was and radiation and surgery and potentially chemotherapy as well. Mm -hmm. So the thing that I'll just say too about DCIS is because it's a precancer, it's not a cancer that actually spreads yet. So it just exists in the area that it has grown in but it doesn't move around your body. It's not metastatic. So it doesn't move on its own. So I remember it being like Christmas time or whatever, when I got my results or like shortly before. And then my doctor was like, you know, let's make a plan and then we'll, we'll decide what we're going to do. And we'll do it after Christmas. Like there's not a huge rush on this Mm -hmm. because we have, you know, an early cancer that we're talking about. So I don't know if that was like good or bad (laughs) because it's just like, (laughs) You know, you're kind of you're sitting just, around waiting now. Yeah. And I was something you already that, like, know anyone totally. And I would say that anyone who's experienced cancer, like would for sure say that that's the worst part about it is just waiting, waiting. for results, waiting for the surgery, waiting for like whatever. 
So I ultimately decided that I wanted to be very, very aggressive with my treatment. And this was for a bunch of reasons. Number one, my age, I was 26 when I was diagnosed and like freshly 26. So at that time, they also wanted me to do genetic testing to make sure that I didn't carry the BRCA gene, which as well is not necessarily like a good or a bad thing. Like when you find out, because for me, I was, I didn't have any genetic indicators. I didn't have the BRCA gene and there was zero history of breast cancer in my family. So in a way, like it was more unsettling that I had that diagnosis because there wasn't a clear reason for it. Mm -hmm. And I remember asking the genetic specialist and she said, it's, it's because we just haven't found what the indicator is yet. Now I've also worked very closely with an integrative cancer specialist, like naturopathic doctor who agrees with that. And also would, would probably argue that there are most definitely environmental factors in our world that are like affecting women in particular and their like endocrine right. system and their hormones. So I firmly believe that that was why it happened to me. And also I don't really know. What are, what are the- those environmental factors that you think? Um, birth control, number one, that would be a huge one. The other thing is like the endocrine disruptors in our water, like pollutants, like any type of toxin, any type of like carcinogen and products. Like I would say like, and as women, we use so much products. Yeah, totally. So unfortunately, like, it's just not something that you can a hundred percent eliminate. It's like virtually impossible. So it's been a long practice for me of just being like, you know, it's not mindful, but not obsessive. Yeah. Yeah. That. And, and also just like, it's not my fault that I'm here. Like, it's literally just like, yeah, this is just something that, that happened. So, I mean, the biggest argument for your situation, it's like Tessa's 26 and she's also one of the most like healthiest wellness oriented people ever, you know, and the, you, you practice yoga. Like a lot of people say a lot of cancer is from stress. Or it's genetic. But then when you link the stress case to it, it's like you are one of the most like mindful about stress and meditation. So it's like, it just goes to show, of course, it's probably environmental and then like yeah, things that we're putting in our body and things that we don't yeah. suspect. Yeah. And I wouldn't say that like, I'm like free of stress because I practice yoga. No, of like, course, of course. But like, be, yeah, you're more reason. mindful of it than the average person, I would say. Yeah. Or, you know, I'm certainly working on it more regularly than the average person yeah. <laughs> and have been for quite a long time. So mm-hmm. I do think that that was a tool for me, like in coping, but anyways, I, I kind of digress. It's, it was, it was very like apparent to me that I was going to be aggressive with my mm-hmm. journey. And the other thing too, is like, I really wanted to avoid radiation and I really wanted to avoid chemo because those are also really major treatments that you do. And like, they're a hundred percent necessary for some people. And it's very, very easy to make the decision to do that. If you're a postmenopausal woman that has had her children and Mm -hmm. has like, you know, perhaps 20 to 30 years of life left, Mm -hmm. it's not the case when you're the opposite of all of those things. So explain that further, even as women listening, they might not know like what that means. So what you're saying is if you were to go through all the chemo and radiation at the age of 26, that would affect other parts of your life in the future, such as having kids and what else? Well, I mean, a lot of things like another, another type of therapy that my doctors really wanted me to try was tamoxifen or some type of like hormone replacement therapy. Wow. Um, And tamoxifen is like a huge risk increase of ovarian cancer because it's, it's also like a very, very aggressive treatment using synthetic hormones, (laughs) you know, like because of like a hormonal cancer is like obviously very, um, it's like fighting fire with gas fire with more fire. No, I mean, not really like, like for, for some women, it's like, it's the answer. I just don't think that like, you know, for something that I, I feel that my cancer was driven from synthetic hormones. And so like, it just felt counterintuitive to like, then treat it with that. And like, Mm -hmm. I know that like, there's a lot of osteoarthritis that people experience with like HRT and like just a lot of other things. But for me, like the risk increase of ovarian cancer was like number one for me because 
let me go back to my timeline. It'll make a little bit more sense. Like mm-hmm. when I, when I sort of like ultimately decided to not do that. So I opted for a bilateral mastectomy, which means I had both of my breasts removed and then I had a reconstructive surgery as well. So that's a wild experience if anyone's ever kind of heard of it. So basically what happens is like they remove all your breast tissue and then they put in what they call expanders and they're basically implants, but they're rock hard. And they're empty when they first go in because they need to slowly restretch your skin after they remove your breast tissue. Mm -hmm. So you go in every two weeks and they literally insert like a needle into your implant and then they blow your breasts up, which is so crazy and like kind of hilarious too when you're like, when you're experiencing it. So you stretch your skin to the point of like, however, basically large you want your new breasts to be. Then you have to wait three months after your final like blow up. (laughs) I was going to say blow up and I was like, I don't want to be rude. (laughs) No, that's like, like, I'm telling you, you're literally like watching your boobs grow like balloons in front of you. It's kind of a wild experience. And then three months after that, they did another surgery to replace the expanders with like proper silicone implants and then basically do a little nip tuck and make sure everything's like where it needs to be. It's interesting so, that they have to re-expand the breast tissue, even though the breast tissue was just there. I find that very yeah, fascinating. It's not like the breast tissue that they're expanding. It's the skin, the skin. that they're expanding, okay. you know? Yeah. I think a visual would probably make that make <laughs> a little bit more sense, but it's, yeah, it's kind of hard to explain. So ultimately I decided to do bilateral because when you're so young and you have all this life ahead of you, your risk recurrence percentage is quite high, obviously. Right. Yeah, because well, you because have more life, all this life ahead yeah, yeah. of you. Yeah, for you to develop cancer again, uh, which could be, you know, a different kind of cancer, or it could be the same type yeah. of cancer. So I just wanted to be very, very aggressive, and I opted for a bilateral mastectomy. And then what they did was they removed two lymph nodes. They removed my sentinel node, and then they removed like one more node. So they just do that by basically injecting you with dye. And then they see like where, like what lymph nodes are kind of dominant. They remove those and then they test them as well. Mm -hmm. So what they found when they did my mastectomy was that I had a significantly large piece of DCIS still left in my breast. So that told me a couple of things. Number one, first of all, no MRI no ultrasound, no mammogram was picking that up. So I did in fact Very. have more DCIS in my breast that was not detectable by this type of imaging. Mm-hmm. Number two is that I made the right decision, um, having a mastectomy because if I were to just do radiation, like who knows if that would have kind of got rid of it all. And then the other thing was that they actually found DCIS in my sentinel node. So normally that would be like with a metastatic cancer, that would be bad or not good. I should say not necessarily bad, but definitely not good. And the thing that was so confusing for my oncologist was that, uh, like I said before, DCIS doesn't actually spread on its own because it's not metastatic. So they were like, why is there like, like this DCIS in the lymph node? when like that type of cancer doesn't move. So what they think happened was what they call a mechanical spread, where basically instead of the cancer traveling to the lymph node on its own, what your lymph node does is it cleanses, you know, your body, it kind of like moves things throughout your body. So they believe that when I had my lumpectomy, that my sentinel node was cleaning the area of trauma and then sucked a cancer cell to itself. So they call it a mechanical spread rather than like a true cancer spread. So because of that, (laughs) when I had my sentinel node with uh, DCIS in it, they were like, you know, now that it's basically in your lymphatic system, it could basically be anywhere in your body. So they weren't sure if they wanted me to do chemo at that point. And ultimately my case got looked at by a lot of different doctors. It went to the Toronto board of tumors. And then it also went to like the Canadian board of tumors too. So a lot of oncologists looked at my case and they ultimately decided that I did not have to do chemotherapy. 
-hmm. And that was also dependent on, like I said, my estrogen receptor positivity and my HER2 positivity. So I was estrogen receptor positive. And, and what does that mean again? That before. It basically Just, means you, you take on a lot of estrogen or it's always high. Yeah. It's definitely like a higher, like a higher amount An of average. estrogen. Yeah. Um, I, I believe I'm not, not a hundred percent sure anymore. I would have been able to articulate this better like a few years ago, but it definitely has to do with something about like the way my body metabolizes estrogen. And it's like okay. kind of inability to do that. But I think that when you have estrogen receptor positivity, like if you have like a, like a hormone receptor in your body, if it's a positive receptor, like cancer can like, like bind to it more easily. So it's just like less ideal, obviously. So I was estrogen receptor positive, but I didn't know that you could be like, it's not like you are, or you are not. It's like, you're like, you could be anywhere from like zero to a hundred percent. Spectrum. Positive. Yeah. So I was quite low. I was like 15% considering. And so wow. that was my decision that like, that really made my decision to not take tamoxifen because my risk increase of ovarian cancer was like virtually the same as my risk decrease of, you know, a recurrence of DCIS. So it was like, kind of like, you know, like, it's just hard to like, think about, mm -hmm. it's hard to think about all that and be like, you know, did I make the right decision? Like, ultimately I was so happy to not do chemo obviously. Yep. And then I just sort of like carried on after those two boards looked at my case and said like, you know, you're done your treatment. We feel strongly that like you're, you're good to go. So I basically carried on. I went yeah. and I, I did my reconstruction. And then about a year after that, I saw my medical oncologist who was like, you know, you can always follow up with your breast oncologist because I was referred around a couple of times. And then I went away on vacation and didn't I feel a lump in the same area that they found like the larger piece of DCIS when they did my mastectomy. Mm -hmm. So I actually went to my medical, not my medical oncologist, my breast oncologist. And I was like, I feel this lump. And he actually was like, I don't feel anything. Like he couldn't feel what I was talking about, but I felt this like pinch almost when I was pushing on it. And that was the first time I ever had a biopsy. So like he, he had me do a biopsy at that point. They did find more DCIS wow. and I actually didn't even tell anyone that time. It was kind of, kind of messed up, but it, I think I was just like, so scared. You were just like, like yeah, you, I'm sure like when you're going through your own grief and your own cancer diagnosis, telling other people, I'm sure adds even more stress and people's emotions on top of it all. Totally. And I think that like something that I've repeated many, many times, like when talking about my experience is just that like a lot of it is like holding space for other people's reaction about your health experience. Mm -hmm. So like I had to hold a lot of space for like the people closest to me, obviously, because I had to be like, it's okay. Like, I'm going to be fine. Like it's, you know, I'm going to like, I can get through this again. Like it, it was harder for me to lean into them and, and be like, I need support. Cause this is fucked up, you know? So I didn't tell anyone, I didn't tell anyone until I knew that I had the wow. second diagnosis. And that's when I started making all these phone calls being like, Sue, here we go again. And luckily it hadn't progressed in stage or anything like that. It actually was in the exact same area, like I said, as the wow. bigger piece. So I believe. And this was during just a regular follow up after everything, right? No, I, because I had the follow up oh, yeah, okay. and they were like, you're good to go. And then I. And then felt, you forced yourself I back. I felt something like yeah. a week later and I was like, I just don't feel right about that. So good for you. A lot of people don't advocate for themselves enough, but I know you've said before, like you advocate it for yourself a lot and I definitely kind of, did. You have to yeah. in anything, especially a situation like this. Totally. So basically I believe that this might be like a bit of a controversial thing, but I'm, I'll just say it. Like, I believe that the first time around all of my breast tissue wasn't retrieved because so, so through the mastectomy, you feel like not everything was removed. Yeah. And like, they say that, like, it's like, you can't guarantee you're going to get 100% of all of the tissue. Like you have tissue all the way up to your collarbone, you know, like they can't just remove all of that skin and everything. And, and you just be, you know, like obviously like 99% of it is gone, but you still have 
like minor traces of breast tissue on your chest wall or like whatever mm-hmm. in your armpit area all the way around to like, you know, where your bra strap would be. Yeah. So I don't believe that it was a true recurrence of the cancer. I really, really think that it was never fully gone mm. and I didn't have radiation the first time around. So my doctors very much qualified it as a recurrence which is really what escalated my case the second time around. Mm. I really think that it was that I had some breast tissue left over that just was still kind of there and still had some of, because it was the exact same place and the same grade and everything. So ultimately they did a repeat bilateral mastectomy. So if you've ever heard of someone who's had a bilateral, so two Mm -hmm. mastectomy twice, kind of wild, you know, it's, it's like, I, I don't think the number is that high. Right. And even when I was going through like all the paperwork in, in the hospital, or like when I was in that day for like my second bilateral, like even the nurses were like second bilateral, like, what does that even mean? Like, it was yeah. just like, so ultimately I, I had my breasts removed again. And then I had recon again. right away. Yeah. So, and this is the span of what, two to three years less than, so I was diagnosed the first time in 2017 and then my next diagnosis. So that was late 2017. And then my next diagnosis was March of 2019. Yeah. So it's pretty fast. So this time around, they were like, we really want you to do radiation, which I did. And, you know, I I was reluctant to do it for sure, but I'm glad that I did because whenever I have these like anxious moments, I just remind myself that I did that and it does help me for sure. Now I had it on my left side. So like basically they had to radiate my heart. So like I've had to like be very proactive with like my cardiovascular health and and things of that nature as well. But, um, you know, just speaking of kind of wild things that modern medicine can do, like blowing up your, your implants, like by a needle. One thing that they do when you're receiving radiation on your left side Mm -hmm. is to reduce the radiation exposure to your heart. They have you take a really deep breath in and that basically inflates your lungs all the way so that there's as much space as possible between your breast and your heart. So it's just like, sometimes I have these moments like in my journey where I'm like, that's, that's just like, it, it's so like obvious, like it's such an <laughs> obvious thing that you would do, but I'm like, oh, cool, so smart. In modern medicine, like you, like you say, we have so much fantastic technology, but yet this is just like a deep breath. Very simple. Yeah. Sometimes it's not that complicated. You no. know, take a deep breath. So we like get your heart as far away from the radiation as possible. Mm. Like, oh yeah. Okay. What so, is the process of radiation? Like, like what, like what happens? Like, how long is it? Like, how often do you have to go? Is it just one thing? So I think it's different for everybody. My experience was I did 20 rounds of radiation, which is basically 20 consecutive days where you go. I went to Princess Margaret and you go to this like basement dungeon and then you go right. into this. As, if, as if what I'm doing is not depressing enough. Like put me in a nice room. Well, I mean, to be fair, like the staff is fantastic. I know that it's like a radiation exposure thing, but it's like, so I did 20 rounds and then I did five boosters. So basically it was 25 consecutive days of radiation for me. And you basically lie down in this machine and then I have tattoos. Like, so they line up the lasers to these tattoos that they put on you that are like permanent tattoos. And then- Yep. And you don't move like you lie on this bed and then they line you up like they line your tattoos up to the lasers. And then like I had like a like almost like a snorkel gear. So I took my deep breath. It would hold my breath and then it would it would just radiate me. And um, it didn't last long. Like I, I remember one time being dropped off for radiation. I went in and my boyfriend circled. He did a loop around and like I was out by the time he was like, yeah, it's really fast. It is fast. So, okay, I why did I think I get chemo is what you sit there for hours, right? Yeah, radiation is pretty quick. It's just more of it's just more annoying because it's just like you know, it like disrupts your entire life. You go yeah. every single day, yeah. But it's uh, it's funny because when I was reading about like how to like prepare for radiation, like a lot of people were like, oh, the staff was so great, like you know, they put like music on for me and they 
did this and they put a blanket on me, like the whole thing. And like, I, I remember reflecting after and be like, no one ever did that for me. <laughs> and then no music, then, no blanket. <laughs> no, but, but it was funny because someone had pointed out who had come to radiation with me one time and they were like, yeah, but that wasn't like, that wasn't what you needed. Like I needed to go in there. They'd literally be asking me my date of birth and I'd have my clothes off. And I'd like, like normally they leave the room so you can just rub. I just be like done, like throw it. Like you're going to see what's going on here. Anyways, throw it on the chair, hop on the table, like just get it done. I just want to do it and then get the fuck out of here. Cause I don't want to spend time in like princess Margaret's so depressing, you know? So that was my tour. I did 20, 20 rounds of radiation with five in boosters. 2019 in 2019. And then since then I, because radiation really fucks up your, your tissue it tightens things. It really binds your connective tissue. It makes it super sticky, but like my range of motion was affected. And then my implant was affected too. So I've had two surgeries since then just to correct what radiation did to my, yeah. So I've had like seven surgeries in total. I've done 20 rounds of radiation and five boosters. I've done like IV therapy. I've done you know, hyperthermia therapy. I've done all kinds of hormone balancing regimes and yeah, it's just been a really, really long journey. And it's wild because like my most recent surgery, that was a correction of my, um, my recon was just this past June. And it's like, I like, when does it end? Don't even, I don't know that many people that have actually, I don't know anybody. I know there's people out there, but it's like, I was diagnosed in 2017 and it's like, here I am in 2022, like still just like doing this thing. And like, you know, I'm so tired. I'm tired of like the conversation around it. It's a lot. I think that when you're sort of like speaking for yourself, like a lot of people don't know like cancer jargon unless you're in that world. So you're doing a lot of explaining. And like, sometimes people even now will be like, so like, are you okay? Like, is everything good? And I'm like, yeah, I have been for years, but it's like, they don't get it. Cause I'm still doing surgeries. And I totally get yeah. that. Right. So yeah, it's definitely been like a process of like, just being okay with where I'm at. And also like trying to unravel like everything that happened because it's really, really traumatic to go through something like that. And it affects so many different things in your life. Like it obviously affected my, my ability to work. It affected my relationship. It affected, you know, how, how, like I see myself for sure. Mm -hmm. And like, I do a yearly MRI that checks in on me and that is like very, very anxiety inducing every single year because you know, you're, you're worried about are you going to find something next or something yeah next? and like theoretically I'm fine and I keep trying to remind myself but it's just not something that goes away when you when you've had two even one cancer diagnosis that's just like oh I'm not like you know it's something not, that's always in the back of your mind yeah and like I'm not an invincible person I'm not and like you you totally think you are when you're 26 Yes. You know, of course. <laughs> yeah. You don't but think about more these things people, at all. Yeah. And more and more people in my life are being diagnosed like at young ages and it's wild. Mm. It's so, so wild. But I mean, we all know the stats, it's like one in eight or one in six now. So, and I feel like know? the stats are getting smaller and smaller, like the, the higher, the higher, the probability. Yeah. And like, I try not to dwell on that because like, I used to see like, commercials or like I'd watch a movie and like if I like like hearing the other thing too is like people this is really weird but like people also like to tell you like about people that have died that have had cancer like that gives me so much anxiety to like Like, why would you talk about that yeah totally and it's but I'm telling you like it's something like the things that I've heard out of people's mouths like and I'm not tell us some well, there's no resentment. It's just been my experience, unfortunately. And I, I also recognize that like people don't know how to react. They because don't. it's a wild thing. It's a wild, yeah. wild thing. So I don't mean to be like shaming people, but you know, people like to tell me that they knew someone my age that died of, you know, something similar, or they like to tell me like this one person actually was wanting to connect me with her like spiritual healer, which I'm not like totally unsubscribed to. It's just that like, that's, it's like, I will, (laughs) I will like choose my path. Like, you know, as, as I see fit and like, it, it just is so like ignorant to say to someone who is like in the weeds with the medical system and just being like, Oh yeah, sure. I'll just go heal my cancer with your like medium. Like, are you fucking let me me? sage your house? 
Totally. And, and again, like I said, I'm not even against, I'm not even against like a good staging. I'm just, but it's a bit of a slap in the face when you're so deep into the medical treatment world. Yeah. I had one woman, uh, she gave me a book and because I know her, like I know where her intentions were. And I think that that's the most important thing, but she gave me this book. Um, and I started to read it. I think I read the first few pages and I was like, Oh, I can't read this book. It's (laughs) such like, you know, like it was so, there was just so much bypassing in it. And it was basically like, you are responsible for like what's trauma that's created. Yeah. Like it, it, I'm not articulating it very well, but like, basically she was just saying like, maybe you need to look at yourself a little bit and go a little deeper. And I was just like, so not in a place to be receiving that. So yeah, I would say good, that good like, for you for feeling that the intentions were good. I did like later because I, I yeah. for sure had a moment with her and if she's listening and, and she remembers, I'm, I'm sorry for that, but it's also, um, yeah, it was, it was definitely not what I needed. <laughs> No, I, I think it, I, it, it begs a really good question though. And I've had people in my life get really sick or even have had friends where they've lost a parent or they have someone in their lives that are sick. And I think a lot of people listening never know what to say. Totally. So like, what do you recommend? Like, I guess the question is if someone's listening right now and they have a friend or a family member that are going through, let's be very specific, going through, just got the cancer diagnosis what do you want people to say or what would you have liked people to say and how often to check in? Like, I think everyone that cares about someone that's going through this is sitting on the sidelines being like, what do I do? I love you. And I want you to know, and I want to make all this better, but I don't know what to do or say. Yeah. Like I definitely think that there's a couple of things that are worth mentioning. Like number one would basically just be that like, it's not like, it's not great to assume that someone wants to talk about it. Like, like I said earlier, everyone's experience is just so different. So it's like to offer your like input or your, like your experience or like what you think might help is like, probably not going to be the best thing. Like, you know, like, unless you're someone that is like very, very close to that person, like it's really like, it could be really triggering for someone to just be like, here's what you should do. Because it's like, if you don't, if you're not that person's inner medical circle team or medical team, yeah, it's really like, it's really not okay to opine on like what someone should be doing. And like, they're going to make those, those decisions with their, with their practitioners. So I do think that that that's an important thing for sure. Just to like, you know, acknowledge that this person may not want to talk about those things. Another thing that I think is important is just to like recognize how shitty it is. Like, and I think that it's fine to just be like, that's fucking brutal. And I'm like, so I'm sorry, sorry this is happening to you. Yeah. Okay. I am yeah. so sorry. And, and, and then I think that it's a little bit of a practice too, of just being okay with it being kind of awkward because okay. it is awkward. And I think that it's like, it's so much harder for the person who's telling people I'm not trying to discount like what the experience is for people who are close to that person, you know, Mm -hmm. would experience either, but like, yeah, it's really, really hard to, to hold space for other people. So to just be like, even if you just say like, I'm sorry, I don't even know what to say. Like, this is just, that is so Mm -hmm. wild and I'm so sorry. And that's, that's terrible. And I'm not bothered by someone saying like, please let me know what you need. I think my people don't like that. Yeah. Like, I think my experience has been like a really good practice in being like, okay, I need to like ask for what I need. And some people are really bad at that. Um, of course. And it's not that I'm not I- either at times. It's just that like, I know that that can be hard for some people. I wouldn't say that like, you know, if someone shares with you that you, you have to stick to those things. It's so dependent on like how close you are to somebody. Obviously it's so dependent on like the context in which they're sharing it with you. But mm-hmm. like, just to, I think just recognizing that it's really shitty and that you're there for them is, is really all you can do. But like, please don't, it's, please you're don't making offer. it sound simpler than I think we thought the answer was going to be. Totally. But I just think that like a lot of people like freeze and they're just like, uh, like, you know, you should do this or like, or like, or they just blurt. So my mom had it or like, you know, like, it's just like, okay, like it, you're just kind of like bringing me away from like what I'm experiencing over here. Yeah. So yeah. what I'm hearing is obviously show empathy, number one, and, and almost like just put yourself in their shoes and understand like, and make it clear to them. Like, yeah, I agree. This sucks. And basically I love you and I want to be here for you. So like, let me know how I can help. Cause I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. 
totally simple as that, hey? <laughs> it's really simple and uh, it's not easy either. I don't have you for much longer, but I want to ask two big questions. Which one do I want to ask first? Uh, okay, I'll ask this one first because we talked about this right at the end when we first spoke. I want to ask how it affected your relationship, like your romantic relationship, because you said, I think I th- remember you saying like almost like you bottled it up and he bottled it up a lot. And then like, it's only now coming to the surface where now you realize like, oh, I need to grieve. But like, yes, it was years ago, but I haven't had a chance to grieve anything yet. So if you want to talk to that. Yeah. So I think that that was a little bit more apparent after my first diagnosis. And then we went through it again. So like one thing I will just say is like, you know, I've been in a relationship for like nine years with this person and he was so incredibly supportive throughout my experience. And also like he, he was going through it too. And that was really hard for me to recognize, like when I was first diagnosed Um, only because like, I couldn't possibly imagine that it could be harder for like someone else than it was for me, which is maybe like, I don't know if that's like a a selfish or immature thing to say, but I just feel like when I was going through it, I was very much doing all the types of therapy (laughs) that I could be doing, like talk therapy, like manual therapy, like anything that I could do because it's so just my realm number Mm -hmm. one, to just be like addressing those things as they're happening. And that doesn't mean that I didn't have shit to deal with, like after the fact too, but like, he was very much my support throughout. And it was, you know, he just had to be strong for me. And so I think that once I finally got like my stamp of good health, that was when he really started to process it because he was like, holy shit, that's, that was really, really hard what we went through. And I was ready to move on. I was ready to be like, I'm healthy. Like, let's celebrate. Let's celebrate. Let's go back to life. Totally. And he was having like a full existential crisis, which like at the time was really, really hard for me to show up for, which made me feel really guilty because he had just shown up for me for so long. And I was like, but I'm I'm sure you're thinking like, we're done with this. What do we have to be sad about? Let's move on. But now he's been your rock for so long. So it's now it's done. He's like, it's almost like, you're holding the tears for so long. Then you're like, okay, it's done. I can release everything. And you're like, no, 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 no. We're done with this. Yeah. Yeah. And like, so that was just something that I wasn't like keeping my finger on the pulse of like during my experience. How would and, like, you? Yeah. How, how, you wouldn't how know. could I for sure? But like, it's sort of crazy. Like that we were like, he was 29 when I was diagnosed. So it's like, that's really really young for like either of us to a like go through just period and then b go through like at such a young age in our relationship too Mm -hmm. um so that was really tough like because there's really no one in our circle that we can look to and be like so how was that for you guys you know what I mean so we really went through it like on our own together and and it's it, there's still for sure healing that that's happening. Like in that, in that process, I would say that like, we are so much better for it. Like I, I, I can only speak for myself, but like, I, I do believe that these experiences like give us so much perspective and so much depth. Like if we move to the other side of them, like, I'm not going to sit here and be like, what well, doesn't kill you makes you stronger or like whatever. But it's also just like, I wouldn't necessarily trade my experience, which is probably <laughs> like Shocking a kind of wild thing to say. Yeah. But yeah, like I, it was, it was tough. Like we were, we were young and we were like looking at each other and it was like, I think I said this to you before too. Like I was thinking in my mind, like you can leave me if you want. I didn't say that because obviously that's not what I wanted him to do. I really wanted him to stay. And I'm sure that he had those experiences too, those thoughts just being like, I can't leave or I don't want to leave because I'm an asshole if I do that. But also I love her and I want to support her. It was very, very monumental to go through together at such a such a tender age. I think it's pretty normal, not normal, but like more common for people that are like older and like have been in a a long time. Cause at this oh, yeah. point you guys were, yeah, like four years into your relationship at this point, like still relatively new, even for like a longer term relationship. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and it, and really like, it was just, 
I think it was really just about how young we were and like, what do we want in our lives? And like, do we want to be holding hands doing this? Like, I know, I know women that were like, I know one woman actually that was my age when she was diagnosed too. And she didn't have a partner and just watching her go through that. Like she had a different tour and she did chemo and she did the whole nine yards that Mm -hmm. I didn't do. And I'm like, I don't know if like, that would be harder, you know, because you're like, you lose all your hair and and then you're just like, I don't know, there's just so much more explaining that would go into like just having a partner after that. And like so much more like vulnerability and like Mm -hmm. risk that like, I didn't really have to go through, but also like my relationship is forever touched by this experience. That's never going to change, you know, Um, even if we heal as much as we can possibly heal from it. It's really simple to say, but as a relationship, if you go through something like that, there's not much more else that you can't get through together, you know? Yeah. And uh, I'm just putting it out there that I don't need any more shit to the universe. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> I've been <laughs> I tested. Need any more lessons. I passed the test. Don't give me any more bullshit. <laughs> yeah, please. I'm good. Thanks. Last question for you. I, I, you know, I want to ask you like 4,000 more. I like, I feel like we've only touched the surface. Uh, there's so many other aspects and, and depth that you can ask about this experience, but do you look at your life now as pre-cancer and post-cancer? No. Okay, good. No, I don't. It's just happened. It's just something that happened throughout. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Like, I don't, maybe, maybe that's not that exciting of an answer, but no, I don't look at it. No, that's a good answer. That's a good answer. That's, that's why I prefaced it with it It is two parts. So (laughs) yeah. How has this experience given you a completely different view or shifted your perspective on life Um, or has it? Yeah, no, it, it definitely has. I would say that like anything kind of monumental or like, you know, when you have a day when you're just like, you're so rattled by something or you're so like, sad or just shook by something it's just like really intense in the moment and then it wears off like I will say that on a much larger scale like cancer is a similar experience Mm -hmm. I unfortunately like wear my my scars a lot more like obviously you know but I will just say that like yeah like that feeling does subside it doesn't go away but it does subside um like the fear and like the intensity of like you know that whole experience but I think that in relation to the perspective shift and like my comment earlier about not wanting to change my experience is just that like, it's really given me this opportunity to connect with people on a much deeper level and also just understand and have more empathy and be like more zoomed out at times. Like, I think that one, one like instant that I can, I can really remember is like driving with my boyfriend. I think we were leaving an appointment and like, there was, I don't know, there was like a moment of like road rage (sighs) on both of our ends. And we were just like having a serious moment with like someone who just did something on the road. And it's like, I've been the receiver of that. (laughs) And it's like, who knows what anyone is going through. And I think that that's such an easy thing to say when like, you know, someone over there is having like a major reaction that you're not like really a part of, but it is a practice of mine and I'm not perfect at it, but I will just say that like, I do, I do really try and understand that like everyone's experience is so different and we really never know anyone's whole story and how that affects what their decisions are, or their mood is, but I just think that everyone's really trying to just be a good person <laughs> and everyone would probably say that they are too. So yeah, I would just say it's, it's definitely given me like a lot of depth that like I didn't ask for, but I definitely wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it. That's for sure. There's not a lot of people that look at the situations they've been through with such reflective, positive gratitude you know, very rare, I think. But I mean, if we want to link it all back to all those people with all the energy opinions, I mean, I feel like you're putting out good energy in the world, even even through everything you've been through, you know, like I've known you for years and I feel like you've always been that like warm light of a person Mm -hmm. that seriously though, there's a lot of like empathy and compassion. And I think anyone listening to this today that knows you personally, it's, it's always the person that never deserves it. You know, Mm -hmm. it's the person that treats everyone with kindness. And that's the person that's given the hardest 
hand to deal with, I find. And so it's yeah. unfortunate that it, it happened to you, but I mean, like you said, you wouldn't trade your experience for the world. And so it, it warms my heart for you to say that. Yeah. And, and, and we both know that, you know, that's, it's just not how life works, unfortunately, but it's also, um, yeah, I, I, I would just say like, thank you. Number one for, for saying that that's so sweet. And, and yeah, like, I think if I could leave, um, anyone with anything, it's just that like, no one really asks to be a part of like this, like kind of fucked up community of people, but like, it is a very supportive one and it is a very like significant one. And not that I think it will mean anything <laughs> to anybody, but like, if anyone wants to reach out to me, I'm, I'm more than happy to chat. What do you mean? Of course people want to reach out for you. Like <laughs> if anything, like I, I truly mean this when I say this, I really want you to write a book. This could <laughs> this could be one chapter or it could be the entire book, but I just think there's so much like depth and knowledge. I mean, our conversation, very practical and also very informational, but also it's like, you can tell through your voice, like you've been through it and, and you've reflected on it a lot. So I just want to thank you for being like so open and willing to share the story. And also, even though it's exhausting to keep saying the story and keep saying the information, the next time someone asks you a question, you can just send them this link. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me.